Salam and welcome back to Somali Dispatch, SomaliDispatch.com, and to our weekly dispatches program, where we discuss uh, some of the biggest uh, Somali-related uh, news items of the week. My name is Abdi Qadir Gulen. This week we discuss the ICJ rulings on the maritime dispute between Somalia and Kenya, China's accusations of Taiwan's ruling party, DPP, for uh, bribing Somaliland uh, politicians and their families, and also uh, the OCHA uh, reporting on the escalation of the last Arnold evictions. To discuss these issues, uh, we are joined by Guled Jama and Mohamed Warsame. Guled is a humanitarian rights defender and an activist, and Mohamed is uh, an economist and a data scientist lecturer at BPP University School of Technology in London. He also writes uh, extensively about East African political issues. Welcome to Somali Dismatch, both uh, Guled Ahmed Jama and Mohamed Ahmed Warsame. Um, First, uh, let's tackle the big uh, elephant in the room, if you will, which is uh, the ICJ uh, maritime dis dispute between uh, Somalia and, and Kenya have been ruled uh, on the 12th. Uh, Gulet, if you can um, give our audiences and ourselves uh, the top line legalese terms and what that ICJ ruling uh, was based on and how you perceived it. Thank you very much for having me and um, um, and, and, and in the show. The that was a good news on the twelfth for for the Somali people in Somalia. Uh, but we start with uh, two neighboring countries to have a dispute is not unprecedented. It is normal, and it's one of the reasons the ICG was first established. The ICG predominantly decides on cases between sovereign states. And the reason is to prevent and avoid violence and war between countries. You know, previously, neighboring countries or any other states, when they have a dispute, they used to resort to war, uh, and that has left catastrophic wars in the world. And then the ICG and the United Nations in general, and these different agencies are there to solve these disputes. Africa general it has not eliminated its maritime borders. Uh, therefore, it's not also an issue between only Kenya and Somalia, but an issue that will be happening either through negotiations or otherwise in many parts of Africa. Um, Somalia has been in a state of difficulties since the collapse of the central government of Somalia in the 1990s. Uh, and apart from the Kenya, I wanted to take some maritime areas from Somalia. I believe take, trying to take advantage of the circumstances to Somalia as a country it is now. Uh, but under the under international law, uh, countries can negotiate or go to mediation, arbitration, or adjudication. Kenya and Somalia first tried to resolve the problem through negotiations. Negotiations didn't work. Then Somalia went to court. The court had both parties. Uh, Kenya first objected to the jurisdiction and competence of the court. Basically, it said the court cannot hear this kind of case. Uh, the court uh, disagreed, Kenya, and proceeded with the case. Then Kenya withdrew the case, and the court was forced to proceed the rest of the case in the absence of a Kenya, and that's pretty legitimate uh, under, under international law. Uh, the final verdict was made in the trial. It's a final. There's no appeal. Uh, it means the case has been settled um, and it has been decided in favor of Somalia, actually. Uh, Kenya now is unhappy, but on international law, this is the end of the history. What is remaining only is to accept and respect the court's decision. Right. Uh, if I may add, before I bring uh, Mohammed Warsama into the conversation, uh, what were the highlights, uh, if you can name a couple, um, that would favor um, Somalia thinking that they won what they predominantly went after, uh, which some would say initially uh, it was theirs to begin with, but Kenya challenged it and, and actually wanted to take that. What were the um, nuances in that uh, ruling that you can highlight here? The, the argument of Kenya was to have to draw a parallel line, and that's what the court rejected, and that's what court, court Somalia disputed in the case. Somalia wanted a distance line. Court, the court accepted that. 
but it made a little adjustment uh, on, 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 on the basis of, of equity. The court said uh, Kenya uh, might become cut off or enclave if the equity stance line is drawn, therefore little adjustment is made. The lawyers of Somalia, when they made the measurement of that, they said it is 25% of the disputed area goes to Kenya. 75% it goes to, the, to Somalia, and that's the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, but when it comes to territorial waters, Somalia got 100% of what it argued or claimed. Therefore, it is a success for Somalia. It is simply having to dispute someone. You want the vast majority of what you wanted. A little bit of that went to your brother or sister. Uh, and I believe Somalia never wanted to take anything from uh, Kenya. And I believe Somalia never wanted to be addressed to, 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 to Kenya. Therefore, that's why they accepted the 25 percent to put Kenya, because uh, no one wants Kenya to be enclaved or to lost completely uh, uh, across the waters. And one of the reasons that happening is the way the border between uh, Kenya and Tanzania was eliminated because Tanzania has islands. And through that, when the distance line was thrown, it curved towards Kenya. Therefore, now Kenya is like an enclave where, where, where it has. Therefore, the court said, although the dispute, although Tanzania wasn't part of the dispute, but they cannot neglect the fact of the geography. And it took a lot of examples. There are charges, learned charges in the court, which dispute that treatment, a charge use of inclusive. Uh, but that is a matter of jurisprudence and legal scholarly debate in the future, whether what the court has done is unprecedented, some may claim that, or whether it's right or wrong. Uh, but from Somali's perspective, Somalia got what it wanted. Right. Um, Judge Yusuf, um, Yusuf actually did contest that and, and write an opinion about that. And, um, you know, it's true the way um, you know, Tanzania's uh, water, uh, if you will, sea borders were, are drawn, it would have came contact with Somalia's that would uh, shut out international waters from Kenya. That was the argument and, and perhaps remains the mm -hmm. argument. But it's interesting to me how Kenya is reacting to the overall decision and for that and how Somalis are reacting to it as well. I bring in Mohammed Warsama. Uh, Mohammed, your top line takeaways and um, it's been a it's been an interesting couple of days since the decision. Um, what are you hearing? What jumps at you when you read this and, and when you saw this? Right. Uh, thank you, first of all. Thank you so much for having me today as well. And uh, thank you to Goulet for his uh, legal understanding and interpretation. I was listening to the verdict from beginning to end and um, you know, keenly observing the wording that was used. And before I, I listened to it, I looked at some of the past judgments. And interestingly, I looked at in the morning, some hours before the, the verdict was declared, I saw the case between Romania and uh, the Ukraine, you know, the, the Black Sea, also a very, very oil, oil rich and uh, natural resource rich region. And it was very, very similar, and I was I was kind of uh, taken aback because in the morning I watched or I kind of researched into the Romania versus Ukraine, and I saw they have made a political settlement even in that case as well. So it was not really unprecedented. What is unprecedented is, however, um, the fact that this judgment was had a political connotation. So of course. For us, uh, for, for everyone who's, who's not from a legal kind of profession, you know, you need to read into Jung Klaus, the, 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 the law of the seas. You need to read into what is the meaning of a continental shelf, what is the meaning of, you know, exclusive economic zone, so on and so forth. But in a nutshell, I think what, is, what, is, what I find quite disturbing as a Somali, even though, of course, I was pleased that, you know, Kenya's arguments were rejected, I was pleased that. Kenya's defiance in a way was was punished because they were first first of all they were trying to to settle this with Somalia out of court and they have they have uh, agreed upon an MOU a memorandum of understanding in 2009 after they have reached an agreement with Tanzania on the the exclusive economic zone so and even though they've reached this memorandum of understanding they have refused any sort of 
approach that was made by Somalia for many years during the time of Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud. When he was president, they refused any form of negotiation. So they were, in a way, making benefiting or trying to benefit from Somalia's fragile situation. So it was the situation of David versus Goliath, a powerful regional player with, you know, with many connections to the world and that has already signed off some of the oil blocks. So there are already some explorations and, and some, some, you know, contracts that have been made. So Kenya is already acting as though it has full legal authority over this disputed territory. And so it was, it was in a way pleasing. But I say only in a way, because I think there was also a political judgment involved. So the court has made a, a, a decision that had a political dimension. And they argued it on the basis of what was agreed upon in a bilateral agreement between Tanzania and Kenya. So I was very, very surprised. I was shocked in a way, uh, in fact, that they have taken into consideration a treaty between two countries that have voluntarily uh, agreed upon their uh, maritime boundary. And so, so and, and there's also this element of different sort of ge uh, geography. So in the, the case Tanzania between Kenya, of course, the, the borderline is also kind of tilted towards the southeast, but there, there are islands off the sh shore of, of Tanzania. There are islands which are part of the, of the, the, the land territory of, of, of Tanzania. So there's a special case between Tanzania and Kenya, which should not affect Somalia and Kenya's uh, dispute. It shouldn't have anything to do with that. But of course, they said it, it is about equity. So they kept repeating an equitable solution to, to, to basically reward Kenya for its geography. And, and Judge Yusuf uh, and Abdul, Qawi, Abdul Qawi Yusuf has made a brilliant statement with regards to that. He said there was a judicial refashioning of geography. So even though the, the court has agreed with, with Somalia that the, the land border continues with the continental shelf, because of course there's, there's what is called shallow water or the low sea, which is part of the coast, and that's where the border should go. So they've agreed with that. But I don't understand why there was this adjustment, why Kenya has been granted some leeway room to accommodate. And it has to do, in my uh, humble opinion, it has to do with, with the oil-rich nature of this part of the sea. There are some agreements and, and uh, some, some of the legal team of Somalia have already explained that, you know, some of the oil blocks, seven, there are seven oil blocks in the region and one of them went exclusively to Kenya by the adjustment. So I think there is something dodgy going on. And again, it's it's just my personal view. But but um, even though there there was there was a largely uh, a favorable outcome for Somalia, there is a hidden and, and problematic dimension uh, which I think deserves to be to be talked about. And that dimension is there's the juror, there's the legal element, and there's the de facto, the factual reality. And the factual reality is that Kenya has a navy, a powerful navy. Kenya has, you know, already uh, eyed this territory and, and it, ha it has already got the ability to claim the sea. So if they have a portion of it, what does that mean for Somalia? Can Somalia defend its other portion? Can it, or is there, is there some situation which, which might disadvantage Somalia? So I think the judgment was a win as well as a loss in a way. So, so yeah, that's my point. So um, let's move on to the other news in, in the headlines, if you will, I should say, uh, which is China accusing Somaliland politicians and their families of uh, receiving bribes and benefiting from the relationship. Guru um, Guled, and uh, perhaps if you can give us your, um, you know, analysis of, on, on that situation or when you saw that, what came to mind for you? China is very unhappy that Somaliland has uh, become engaged with Taiwan. It is not happy that Taiwan is in the Horn of Africa and is becoming uh, a force or a foot on the ground, closer to their Chinese base in Djibouti. Uh, therefore, the relationship between Taiwan and Somaliland uh, has different levels. It is the level of Somaliland and Somalia, where Somalia is not happy with that. But it also has a level of Taiwan and China. It's a rivalry between uh, four entities. Um, 
And I'm, I might not be surprised to see allegations coming from China because I think China is not happy with, with, uh, with the relationship, relations between Taiwan and Somalia. And um, I read uh, in, in the newspaper the support is the government of China, and there were no any uh, credible evidence regarding that. Therefore, it is, I, I see this allegation coming from someone who is not happy with the relationship between Somaliland and, and Taiwan, and it seems um, understandable that they are making such allegations, but there are no evidence associated with it. Right. Uh, one of the things that they've cited in, in, um, in, in the article. Uh, Global Times, uh, China's Global Times, one of the things that they've accused uh, the Somaliland politicians and their families was that they were benefiting um, from the relationship uh, via investments and, and scholarships given to Somaliland. Um, there has been questions around that and when, when it came to light that China is, uh, uh, Taiwan is actually providing uh, some scholarships and other investments, the way that is distributed uh, there's been a lot of media uh, questioning that mm -hmm. how it came to the awarding of those scholarships, for example. Um, does is, does it ring a bell? Is there anything to to what China is saying? Is is this a, a more of a personal relationship than a, a country to country, um, you know, uh, political um, linkage? I think there is nothing special about that. You, you know, the, the Somaliland is well known of its lack of transparency and accountability when it comes to how it handles scholarships, but also how it handles trade agreements and other benefits Somaliland is getting from these outside engagements. Um, and, and, and that goes to many places, it goes to Ethiopia, scholarships given by Ethiopia, but also uh, contracts given by the government and the likes. But what the, the, the report in the Global Times was alluding was that the, the, the somehow saying that Taiwan has poked Somalian politicians into the relationships. And that's something I think is very hard to swallow. Uh, but I would not dispute if these arrangements are mishandled, even if there's no proof, this bit of open secret that this kind of engagement is not properly handled in the absence of lack of accountability, but also I would say lack of independent regulatory bodies in Somaliland that can regulate and govern how these resources are allocated in Somaliland. Uh, we know not only um, uh, what we get from the foreign support, but also uh, our patch allocations and things like that, how people are hired by the government. There are a lot of questions of how internal issues are running in Somaliland. Right. But the allegations China is making in relation to Taiwan and Somaliland seem to me it's coming from someone who's very angry about the relationship and therefore trying to make up things. Right, right. Um, Mohammed uh, Warsama, if I can get you to put on your analyst, political analyst hat on for this one and, and perhaps the next item. Um, what is your takeaway in, in, in general, the relationship Taiwan and, and Somalia have forged recently and what the accusations uh, from China means? Um, well, I, I think, I think it is, it is uh, very much uh, a reasonable thing to do for an unrecognized nation I, uh, to, to establish connections with other um, unrecognized nations to, to advance their interests and to kind of collaborate in uh, the situations that they're, they're dealing with. Obviously, Taiwan has a much more powerful opponent that is laying claim on its, on its territories. And so it is. It is to be expected. But I think, I think the 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 main question for us is how what what are what are the repercussions going to be for for the relationship between Taiwan and China? Because so, so Maliland obviously is 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 much smaller uh, in comparison to 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 the to the dispute between China and Taiwan, and and Somaliland it stands to benefit from this relationship more. I think. I think the scholarships that were given, the the kind of assistance and and the the opportunities that this relationship opens up, is is going to be beneficial for more than those politicians that are said to be bribed and, and whose families are said to to be involved. And from from my perspective, I think there aren't really any negative 
consequences for for Somaliland because what what does it stand to lose? You see, it it doesn't it gain it, it is going to gain scholarships. It is going to gain a new ally, and the question is what is what will it lose if it engages with with Taiwan? It obviously China is not going to retaliate militarily. It is not going to punish Somaliland um, for for you know engaging. In, in what is best for its own political interest. So, so as far as I'm concerned, um, we can we can look at it from many perspectives. But the reality is that it is it is not really consequential. So the the ripple effects will be minimal. I don't think if if there will be any at all. So it is it is just a small win for an unrecognized African territory. And for, for China, it's just a continuation of the, the, the kind of the squabbles between China and Taiwan. So I don't really I don't really see this having a big impact on the region or on, on any sort of relationship. Um, it, it is just going to it is going to ferment China's support for, I think, for the Federal Republic of Somalia, because it sees its best interest to 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 kind of undo what Taiwan is doing in Somaliland. So it, it is just going to reinforce the status quo. I think that's the, the only conclusion I can derive from it. Guled, in our last discussion point, uh, your reaction uh, to the UN humanitarian agency, OCHA, uh, reporting on the last annual evictions uh, with a number of uh, you know, evictions um, escalating from 700 to 7,250 displaced. Um, Give us your reaction uh, to that reporting. It, it is very sad that Somalia has acted in such a way. You know, thousands of people who live here in Las Hanov in many years have been rooted out. The tears with due process of law. Uh, we are talking about children, families, newborn babies, uh, 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 expelled uh, simultaneously and indiscriminately from their homes. Uh, and business places. I think that was very sad to happen. Uh, some local human rights organizations in the UN and others has, have condemned it and asked the government of Somalia to stop that and to approach the issue responsibly and humanly. It seems the government is very deviant. The president has spoken today um, and he seems to insist that the expulsions will, will continue. Uh, people in Ergabo, Sanat region were also given new teas to leave within 14 days and as it expired very soon. Uh, it has caused a humanitarian crisis and I think it has, um, it has created problems on many families and I believe the government of Somalia has reevaluated its strategy and policy towards this issue. I believe the government has to stop these massive expulsions. It can't address security or immigration issues by following the constitution and migration laws of Somalia. There is a way to handle matters. If it is a security, the criminal justice sector can work. If it is immigration thing, the immigration system and laws are in place. Uh, I don't really see the rationale behind uh, expelling thousands of people from their homes who have not teach. These people live there more than 20 years. I, I, I'm from Antarctica, Senate. And I remember people, <clears throat> sorry, from South, uh, uh, from Baidoa uh, and um, Bayan Bakol, who lived there in when I was like a kid. You know, they have been there as long as I remember. Um, therefore, I, I can't imagine them being put out. Mohammed Warsame, same question for you. Um, uh, you know, your view on, on the escalating Las Ano defections and the looming humanitarian crisis. Uh, if you can uh, give us your take on that, would be um, excellent. Thank you so much. No, uh, as Goulet has already pointed out, it is a humanitarian catastrophe. There are thousands of people. Um, some have already perished in, on their way to, to their native um, ancestral lands. So um, mothers who kind of gave birth on the road. So besides the humanitarian disaster that this has caused, I think the biggest signal, so in my personal view, and, and I could be wrong, but I think this was a political decision. It was, it, it had nothing to do with security because these people have been living there for, for decades, for 30 years, and the security deterioration is uh, a rather recent phenomenon. 
And so, so it was a political statement. And I believe it was in response to um, Mogadishu or the central federal government claiming to conduct an, an election which was for Somaliland as a region. So I think um, this was a well-calculated political step. It was a, it was a chess step in a way to, to make Southerners expel those politicians who hail from Somaliland and who, in the eyes of the uh, Hargis administration, who, who are traitors and, and who have renegade on its pledge for independence. So it is, but, but it, it was conducted in a, in a very, very hasty way. And I believe it will, it will not bear the fruits that the individuals who are behind it thought it will bear. So security will not improve. Security is a consequence of the political environment at the moment there. And it will it will have a ripple effect on, on Somaliland's Thank relationship with, with the humanitarian organizations. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Guled Ahmed Jama and Mohammed Ahmed Warsame um, for being part of this week's dispatches until next week. Uh, take good care. And uh, for the rest of you, uh, please uh, visit somalidispatch.com for an updated news uh, and Somali related news and information on, on, that, on, on our website, somalidispatch.com. And uh, please do follow us on uh, Twitter and here at YouTube. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take good care and have a wonderful week.